Here's the one person that can make you feel fine, even if it is the end of the world. Barb Adams. All right, everybody. Good evening and welcome back. You are listening to America Now. I'm your host, Barb Adams. Thanks for listening in. I'm here live with you all three hours tonight for the show. Well, it's hard to believe it's November already, and wow, it just does not feel like it here. Where I reside in Colorado, my gardens and flowers are still going strong. We haven't even had a hard freeze yet, and I'm thinking about this because I listened to the the top-of-the-hour news just now and heard South Carolina just had some snow, so it's really kind of unusual what's going on. Also this weekend, it's the end of daylight savings time. So don't forget to set your clocks back an hour tonight when you are done listening to the show. All right, the elections are right around the corner, and I've selected three great guests tonight who will help try to make some sense of what's going on in our political system, society, and economy. I hope you stay for the entire show, but if you do miss any part, you can listen in anytime on my website, RadioAmericanNow.com, under archives. Well, while the pundits are professing that the Republicans will likely take the Senate, the American public is in a stage of disenchantment and anxiety that is historically unique. In addition, there seems to be something almost unnerving happening, something that seems to be causing people to behave in, well, irrational ways. Could it be that a percentage of the population is actually suffering from a peculiar illness and that they've now taken control of our society? Are we now under the influence of the invasion of the body, mind, soul snatchers? That's the topic this next hour with my guest, Stefan Verstappen. He's the author of the book, Defense Against the Psychopath, A Brief Introduction to Human Predators. He's also the creator of the viral video documentary titled Defense Against the Psychopath. Tonight, Stefan will share with us that psychopaths aren't just insane serial killers, but that anyone, including your boss, politicians, church leaders, and even your child's teacher or next-door neighbor, could be a heartless predator. Stefan is a Canadian author, adventurer, and martial artist. He's worked as a youth street counselor and also a wilderness survival instructor for the Outward Bound program. As an instructor for St. John's Ambulance in Toronto, he won two civic awards for his participation in mock disaster drills and trained police and rescue workers in first aid and CPR. Stefan is one of the first Westerners to live and study martial arts in China with several renowned Kung Fu teachers. His adventures have been featured on TV and radio and in newspaper and magazine. In addition to Defense Against the Predator, he's also the author of several other books, including The Art of Urban Survival, a Family Safety and Self-Defense Manual. If you'd like more information, visit his websites, urbansurvivalstrategies.com, as well as chinastrategies.com. Also, if you'd like to call in, the number 800-259-5791. Again, that's 800 800- Two five nine five seven nine one. Stefan, welcome back to America Now. Hi, Barb. It's uh, good to be back on the show again. Yeah, it's good to have you back on. Well, let's get right to it, Stefan. Why sure. do you believe we are in deep trouble as a society in general? Um, well, because I think our society has been taken over by parasites. Um, it's just like a science fiction movie, you know, uh, ever since, uh, oh, I guess the 50s with the first invasion of the body snatchers, there's been dozens of science fiction movies that, um, you know, where the plot involves a alien parasite that comes in and takes over the minds of the people and uh, with the goal of controlling all of humanity. <laughs> Well, this is uh, actually, um, it's not science fiction. It's true in a sense. And it's true because um, because our society is infected with psychopaths. Um, on our last show when we spoke, uh, we talked about psychopaths and, and um, you know, their influence on interpersonal relationships. And I explained that I believe that, you know, everything has a natural 
explanation. And when I was looking for a natural explanation for why our society is, you know, as corrupt and, and, and uh, falling apart as it is, I came to the conclusion, as many researchers have, not just myself, um, that a big part of the problem is that we have a type of human being that live among us that are different from us and uh, and that they are actually our predators and so you know in in nature i can understand that there are you know everything is eaten and everything eats something else in turn so what are the natural predators for people and um, since you know mountain lions and, and tigers uh, really are out of the picture now as in terms of uh, being our major predator what's left well what's left is other people but people that have a genetic uh, disposition to uh, cause them to grow up to have a lack of empathy and conscience which allows them then to prey on the rest of us so Stefan, i have to wonder though you know uh, you're talking about these psychopaths that we've always had sociopaths and psychopaths out there but are we just hearing more about them these days as opposed to actually having more of them? No, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that's how I I uh, came across the subject myself is by uh, reading a lot of history. And I would read, you know, the, the historical records of uh, the different civilizations. And over and over again, you come across this certain personality type, uh, the one that always became king and the one that became emperor. And um, so, no, and I, I realized that... Um, these people are different, and they've been with us throughout history. And those people are obviously uh, psychopaths. Are there more of them now? That's hard to say because you know, you read history; it's just a, it's a pretty bloody tale. It's, it's endless war and injustice and poverty and cruelty and ignorance. <laughs> not a pretty picture at all. So, are there more of them now? I'm not sure, but what. What could be affecting our our bias of thinking that they are more is because we are becoming more aware of them. Uh, in the past, I think what they did was explain these people through mythology. Um, I think that's where we get the idea of vampires and ghouls and demonic possession. Uh, these were early attempts to explain these people and because they didn't have science to explain what they were observing, they had to fall back on, you know, religion and superstition and, and, and folklore. And so that's where we get these uh, ideas of werewolves and things that, that feed on other people. But now that, you know, we're in the modern age and we have science and we know from scientific research that there is solid evidence that these people are uh, built differently, their brains function differently from normal people. There is no doubt about it. It's been proven with, you know, genetic evidence through MRIs, through uh, behavioral evidence, and so now we can see yes, there is something different. No, they're not the living dead. They're not the zombies. They're not vampires, but they are predators. Yeah, and unfortunately, as you're pointing out, they seem to be at least more noticeable these days. You know, we've always had them throughout history, as you've, as you've talked about. And not all people in positions of leadership, obviously, are psychopaths, but it seems like the ones that really rise to the top throughout history, and even today, following course, are potentially psychopaths and I want to talk to you more about that on the other side of the break and especially why you do call them all psychopaths all right we will return with Stefan Verstappen and the invasion of the body mind snatchers here on America now all right everybody you are listening to America now Barb Adams live here with you my guest is Stefan Verstappen and we are talking defense against the psychopath just in time for the midterm elections <laughs> and Stefan you know you, you you keep talking about the psychopaths and and these can you're you're specifically talking about individuals and these can be all kinds of individuals and as you're talking about this like history's leader and a pattern of these ruthless predators upon the uh, the public basically why do you lump them all as psychopaths 
Um, well, because it's the best sort of identifier that we have right now. If there comes along some other research that would offer a better explanation for what these people are or, or what is happening with them, and you know, there's enough evidence there. Uh, you know, I'd be willing to change my uh, uh, diag- uh, not my diagnosis, my terminology to whatever the new science would reveal. But right now. The best of our science has come up with this term psychopath. There's subdivisions, you know, such as pathological narcissism or um, a histrionic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder. And, but really all of them are, can be categorized under the broad heading of psychopath in that these people do not have the ability to feel empathy and sympathy uh, for other people. And therefore, they're, you know, deep down inside, they're a little bit cold. Well, no, they're a lot cold. Yeah. And, and, and they don't have the conscience. And so that makes them a little bit more dangerous and it makes them ruthless because they don't have the inhibitions that you and I have. Um, you know, if I, if I were to do something pretty rotten and 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 and, uh, and and I can't even describe it if I were to, to betray my conscience I would feel badly about it I would feel guilt if I were to do something that hurt another human being or or cause them some loss I would feel bad about that uh, and uh, but these people don't have that so I lump them all together under psychopath I mean just as a general way of identifying the problem yeah, when you're talking about conscious, it seems like, you know, let's go back to the political thing. Since we are having elections here, you were kind of, everybody's kind of focusing on this this election at this point. Um, here in the States, at least, you're, you're up there in Canada. But, um, you know, these people without conscience, you know, we see it time and time again. They can stand there and just smile and lie to the public. They can steal the money. They can they do all these horrific things, you know, that are more morally and ethically wrong and then they can just stand there and keep smiling and you're right it seems like they have a lack of conscience compared to most people my question is do you think there's some kind of weird evolutionary process possibly going on yeah i do um you know everything comes down to survival strategies um you know, my first book was on, on a, a Chinese military strategy, and uh, I did a lot of study for that. I really tried to understand what is all this thing we call strategy? What is the point of it? What, you know, uh, how does it work? Is there a template? What does it play on? And basically everything is, you know, a survival strategy. Camouflage is a survival strategy. Symbiosis is a uh, uh, survival strategy. Um, a pr- being a predator is a survival strategy. So, um, yeah, the, they're they're incorporating a type of survival strategy, and it's called the cheating strategy. So, for example, if you go to work and you put in your you know your forty to seventy hours a week, and 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 you take home your pay, you know that is your survival strategy. Now, for a predator. For them to expend, let's say, an hour to con you out of your week's pay, uh, that's very efficient. It's, yeah. You know, they they are able to consume or able to acquire within one hour what it took you 40 hours to acquire. So it's called the cheating strategy. They're cheating you. They're conning you. They're lying to you. They're manipulating you uh, so that they can get what it took you so long and so hard to work for. They can achieve it rather easily. So in the cost-benefit analysis of survival, the cheating strategy works. The problem is the cheating strategy doesn't work in a small community because pretty soon everybody in the community knows that, let's say it's Bob. Bob is always borrowing money from everybody and he never pays it back. Uh, You know, it doesn't take too long before that community says, we've had enough with Bob, send him to the next village. 
But in a large society where, uh, uh, like a city or a country, um, they have ample room to move about. So therefore, the larger the society that you move in, the more uh, effective the cheating strategy becomes. And everything is, is, is down to cost-benefit analysis. And in, in the wilderness, it's calories expended uh, minus calories received. And so, um, you know, the fewer calories you can expend to acquire the most calories coming in, the fatter you become, the healthier you are, the longer you're, you will live as an animal. Now, transfer this same you know, survival strategy to humanity, well, the more money you can steal and rob and con, the richer you become, the more children you can have, the bigger the houses, the longer you'll live because you'll have better health care, Add you know, and, and add it all up, it becomes very efficient then. So what we're looking at is ultimately a type of survival strategy. So, Stefan, what about the roles, you know, that mainstream institutions play in helping spread this so-called dis-ease that you're talking about this, with the psychopaths? Well, now we get into something a little bit different. When I first began researching psychopaths, it was for, you know, the art of urban survival, and it was for the first chapter because the first chapter of the book deals with crime prevention because what I feel we're going to see more of in the future is crime. Um, you know, our society is kind of rotting away from an internal corruption. This causes widespread poverty and unemployment. People become desperate, and when people become desperate, they resort to crime. And who can blame them? I don't blame criminals if they, if they steal to feed their families. But, you know, uh, it's our job to learn how to protect ourselves against criminals. So when you examine the psychopath in a criminal environment, the survival strategy is pretty clear. They are a predator. So the mugger that confronts you on the street corner, pulls a pistol, steals, you know, your week's pay, it's a it's a cheating strategy, it's a predatory strategy, and it's cost efficient for the predator at that time. So um but what happens now with society as a whole um, is something different than a predatory strategy and because for example we see that wolves do not become sheep farmers mm-hmm. but you know human beings become human farmers hold so- hold it there Steph, and we're going to have to carry this over all right america now continues after the break with more defense against the psychopath And now, here's the number one talk show host on Venus, Barb Adams. All right, everybody, welcome back. You are listening to America Now. My guest this hour is Stefan Verstappen. He is the author of the book, Defense Against the Psychopath, A Brief Introduction to Human Predators. And Stefan, right before the break, you were talking about society as a whole. And you were kind of comparing, like, you know, with the wolves and sheep. Wolves don't become sheep farmers. However, humans, we do it a little differently. Yeah. And so I'm trying to explain this. We know that on a personal level, psychopaths fulfill the function of predator. They're the criminals, and uh, and they're the players too. You know, uh, the, the Lonely Hearts Club, the uh, you know perpetual victim. Um, you know, they they take from one or two people at a time. But I still, uh, you know, after writing the book, I continued researching, of course, uh, because what I couldn't explain is why some psychopaths are fulfill the role of predator, but other psychopaths are able to take advantage of entire populations, and and it doesn't quite fit into the predator model uh, a predator eats what it what it needs for the day and that's it and then the next day it hunts again um but these other type of paras- uh, 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 psychopaths 
you know, consume huge amounts and, and, and from large bodies of, of people at the same time. So what is this strategy there? Well, you know, again, everything in nature, uh, everything has a natural explanation. And so the closest thing to explaining those types of psychopaths is that they are employing a parasite strategy. And it's one that we often don't think about, but it's a very common strategy in nature. So if I were to make a paradigm and to say that we can look at our civilization, our society, a city, a village, a town, as a living organism, and this is not my idea. Many other scientists have used this analogy before me. And therefore, a city is an organism, a society is a living organism, sort of like a, a giant fungus, really, or an amoeba. And each of us, individual humans, are actually like a cell within the larger organism. So if we look at our society and we see what is happening with um, things that are going around. I'm not, you know, uh, your listeners know, you know, Barb, um, just take a look at the news. <laughs> we can see that, that things aren't getting better. You know, there's something wrong. Everybody knows there's something wrong. There's something sick about our society. So what could that be? So if we look at the parasite uh, strategy, it all fits into a place. For example, um, what we found out about parasites is that in many cases, they affect the minds of the host. They actually take over the brains and the thinking of their victims, which is, once again, back to the science fiction movie, Invasion of the, of the Body Snatchers. Um, an example would be the... Um, uh, the Toxoplasma gondii, which is a, a type of fungus, and uh, it gets into cats, and in order for it to complete its life cycle, it has to be transferred into a rodent, and then the rodent, in turn, must be eaten by a cat again. So what it does when it invades a rodent, a rat or a mouse, is that this, and this is just a fungus, it's not even like an organism, it's, it's the most basic, you know, cellular type of creature, but it is clever enough that when it gets into a rat's body, it invades the rat's brain, and it changes the way the rat, uh, the rat thinks. So, normally a rat has an instinctive fear of cats, and an instinctive fear of cat smells, cat body odor, and cat urine, and will avoid, um, you know, anywhere where a cat may have been. This is its survival strategy. You avoid your predator. But the parasite gets into the rat's brain, and it, um, you know, disconnects that, that, that strategy from the rat. And instead, it causes the rat to find the smell of rats attractive. It seems that it <clears throat> changes the rat's, uh, the rat's perception from fear to sexual arousal. Uh, so when the rat now smells cat urine, it thinks it smells another female rat in, uh, in heat, to say. So it's attracted to that smell. Well, once the rat is attracted to the smell of cats, it doesn't take long before it's eaten by a cat. And therefore, the life cycle of the Taxoplasma gondii is completed. And um, research has shown that there, a lot of these parasites actually attack the brains of the host, and it would change the behavior of the host. Um, uh, of the host, for example, there's another version of a, a parasite that infects minnows. Now, you know minnows; their the bottom side of their belly is very shiny, and the top of them is dark. That way, they can't be seen from either above because they look dark, like the like the water they're in. And if the predators are approaching them from beneath them, their silvery bellies look like the sky. So again, they are camouflaged from predators. However, this parasite gets into the minnow's brain and it changes the behavior of the minnow so that it begins to swim upside down. So now its belly is up 
up to the surface of the water and it's glinting off the sunlight and therefore birds of prey now clearly see the minnows and come down to eat the minnows which again completes the life cycle of that parasite so if we look at our society and if we assume that psychopaths are now fulfilling not only the role of predator but also the role of parasite, then it's not unusual for those parasites to start to change the way we think because we are the host. And so a a society infected by parasites, as I believe our society is, I think it's it's a fatal infection right now, Um, but part of the, the, the pathology of this infection is that those parasites would change the way you and I think. So, Stefan, you know, since we've had ruthless leaders and and psychopaths throughout history, you know, has this, quote, parasite that you're talking about been with us all along, or is this a new type of parasite that seems to really be growing amongst us? Well, it's been with us from the beginning. It really has. And, you know, public relations is not new. It, it goes way back, and, you know, to the earliest rec- written records from civilization. And we see, you know, the propaganda, which is, again, what it, 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 the parasite does. Propaganda is the attempt of the parasite to change the way we think. So the earliest propaganda, um, you know, goes uh, way back into the, the carvings and the stelae that uh, rulers would erect in the town square or in the in the city square, and on the stelae would be written, you know, the history of of the king and his many great accomplishments. Well, you know, mostly lies and, and exaggerations. But because it's carved in stone and everybody who goes to the main square will be able to read the great accomplishments of uh, the, of the overlord, the great king, the great emperor, the, the god incarnate, um, well, you know, that's again the, the early uh, primitive attempts, I would say, of mind control and brainwashing. However, we, we, we now live in a, a fantastic technological society, and so the techniques of the parasites in charge are much more refined. Exactly, and, and what you're talking about, too, is right now with social media, I was going to talk to you about that. It obviously is helping spread this disease or this parasite. So let's talk just briefly about that when we come back as well. And I definitely want to know what we can do to halt the progress of this, quote, invasion. All right, we'll be back with Stefan Ristov and Defense Against the Psychopath here on America Now. All right, Barb Adams live here with you on America Now. Talking about an actual battle going on, it seems, for the entire planet and our collective souls with my guest this hour, Stefan Verstappen. He's the author of Defense Against the Psychopath. And Stefan, before the break, and we were talking about um, the parasites and how they're taking, <laughs> taking us over. So I'm going to let you get back to the institution, especially with the elections coming up. Politics. Yeah, well, politics is, uh, you know, a clear example of, you know, the psychopathic process and the parasitic version of the psychopathic process because, you know, what they have to do is control the way we think. So, you know, what I, you know, it, what I would like listeners to, to keep in mind when they're going to vote is you have to understand that, you know, everything is part of a mind control mechanism. It's it's called propaganda, uh, and it's called manipulation. And uh, but what it is 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 controlling your mind. And actually, this is a natural thing because in nature, that's what parasites do. They go in and they change the thinking behavior of its host. And the way it changes the thinking behavior of its host is detrimental to the host. What they do is they subvert the survival instincts of the host. So when it infects a rat, the rat's survival instinct is subverted and it goes out and gets itself killed. When it infects a minnow, the survival instinct of the minnow is subverted and it goes out and gets themselves killed. Now, you know... Our 
our society is heading in a direction which, from an observation of history, it's pretty clear where we're going. We're destroying ourselves. We're destroying ourselves with the chemicals that we consume, with the uh, with the the unbridled greed and the unsustainable consumption of energy and, and, and the exploitation of the environment. I mean, these are all contrary to our own survival instincts. And so the only plausible explanation for why we as a society seem to be hell-bent on self-destruction is because our minds have been subverted, our survival instincts have been subverted, and have been subverted by the parasites that are currently out campaigning for a re-election. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And there seem to be, you know, it, could there possibly be more than one of these types of parasites where it's learning to adapt, obviously, because it seems not only in politics, it seems to be getting into most of our mainstream institutions as well as just the general public, Stefan. I mean, half the people these days don't know how to think critically for themselves or even think at all. And, and we can go on with lots of examples there, but I think most people automatically can pop up an example almost every day anymore. We're just in general being out in public. You run into people who you just want to go, WT, you know what? It's like, can't they think? <laughs> Yeah. No, because it's it's for the benefit of the parasites in charge to make sure everybody is, you know, stupid. And therefore, you know, how many books have been written about the dumbing down of America and the, you know, the education system, how terrible it's gotten and what is this common core? Have you, you know, looked at any of the math problems and solutions they've come up with? I mean, oh, my God, I couldn't have thought of anything that ridiculous if I had tried. And so, well, who's benefit? Who benefits from having a docile, idiot population? Well, the people that benefit are the psychopaths. So, of course, and it's working. They've, you know, infected the education system. They've infected our religious institutions. They've infected our media. They've infected our corporations. And the purpose, once they've infected all these institutions, is to make us stupid, to keep us distracted, you know. More people can, you know, recognize Kim Kardashian's butt than, you know, <laughs> wouldn't, could name, you know, yeah. the founding fathers, you yeah. know, uh, or, or do a math problem in their head or write cursive, you know. Yeah. I hear so, you. I hear you. Right? So all these institutions are going to adopt the same survival strategy of the parasite, which is you keep your customers stupid and you keep them distracted and you keep them entrained. But what happens now when you look around, and I see it too, you know, you look around and people aren't home. The lights are on. Yeah. Nobody's home. Yeah. They're walking down the street. You know, I was out the other day uh, walking along the lake. Beautiful. The clouds, the trees, the water, the wildlife, the birds, the swans. People are out there walking and they've got their head down in their telephone. And mm -hmm. the entire time they're out there in nature, they're looking at their phone. Mm -hmm. And yet these people probably couldn't carry on a conversation with a real human being. No, their thumbs do all the talking. I mean, it's, it's madness. They're not even there. Uh, people say, well, you know, because I, I, I teach uh, emergency preparedness and, and survivalism. People say, oh, they joke to me, oh, you're preparing for the zombie apocalypse. I said, I'm not preparing for it. I'm living through it right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we are. I, I agree with you on that one. I've been talking about that for a while. It's like they're not really dead people, but they are. You know, they're, they're, yeah, the living, they they're truly are the Walking Dead, and that's about the, the truth dead. of it all. You know, we don't have that much time, Stefan. Um, can you can you put out some final thoughts as well? What can we do to halt the progress of this as individuals? At least protect ourselves. Well, first of all, you got to stop drinking the Kool-Aid, and the Kool-Aid is our popular culture. Um, turn off the TV, get rid of your cable, um, cancel any newspaper or magazine subscriptions, um, disengage from movies. I still like movies. I, I, I'm going to go see Lord of the Rings when it comes out. But, you know, once a year I go and see the Lord of the Rings movie, and that's about it. Um, but otherwise, you know, disengage from the popular culture because the popular culture is only a medium through which the parasites 
are, are controlling and trying to influence and trying to, uh, you know, uh, mind control the population. So disengage from it. Um, I recommend reading and, and going out into nature and doing and get, you know, get rid of the the damn phone. Use it only for emergencies. Really, the whole world doesn't need to know what you're doing every 20, every minute of the day and, and what shoes you've just bought or what you thought about this. I mean, forget about that. Your life is passing you by. There is a real life to be lived and it's not lived through some little electronic device. And if we can get back to, you know, the fundamentals of life, experiencing life in the here and now, not through an electronic medium, not through a flickering screen, but actually out in the real world and experience it, this will defeat them. Yeah, but it seems like defeating them is getting harder and harder. It seems less and less people are awake right now, Stefan. So hopefully, where can people get information about you, uh, the classes you teach, as well as where can they get the book so they can actually read about what they may need to be doing? Well, the book is called The Art of Urban Survival, and it's it's meant to be a Boy Scout manual for adults on how to survive the next five to ten years of what's coming, which is increased crime and corruption, um, the natural disasters that the government won't be able to bail you out of, so you're going to have to deal with it on your own, and natural disasters like war and martial law. And so the book is it's meant just, it, it, it's got everything in it, and it's safe for families. There's no conspiracy theory in it or anything like that. Um, so, and you can get that on Amazon and uh, and just Google it. it. It's available on Kindle and uh, different formats. My website is uh, ChinaStrategies.com. It has just like everything I do in there. So, if you're interested in, in, in that, you know, my martial arts articles, my artworks and videos, everything's on there. And the uh, website Urban Survival Strategies talks about my disaster preparedness uh, programs uh, because I think, uh, you know, we need to get ready. <laughs> you know, look, look, the end game to this parasitic infection is the death of the host or a really heavy fever and a lot of sweating of blood like the Ebola. Um, you know, if we, I don't think we're going to die from it. I think we'll get through it, but we're going to go through a fever period. And during that fever period where we, you know, uh, the, the, the body tries to expel this infection, things will be tough, and uh, people have to be tough and be self-reliant. It's really important for people to be self-reliant, to have six months' worth of food stored and a medical kit and, and the ability to, you know, cooperate and live on your own. Yeah. Stefan, thanks so much for joining me this evening. All the best to you. Thank you, Barb. All right, we'll continue after the top of the hour break with more American Now. <laughs> 